It is a wintry morning on a remote airfield in Korea as President-elect Eisenhower arrives to fulfill a campaign pledge to inspect the battlefront at first hand. In a three-day whirlwind tour of the rugged Korean terrain, he sees for himself the conditions under which United Nations forces are waging their struggle in sub-zero temperatures. Shuttling back and forth in light observation planes, constantly guarded by a cover of fighters, he is surrounded by a news blackout by all news agencies in one of the best-kept secrets of modern times. A carefully organized blanket of security surrounds the future president as he goes from unit to unit. Accompanying him on his tour is General Mark Clark, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in the Far East, who is welcomed by his top commanders. It is in meetings like this that General Ike is briefed on the actual fighting conditions which face United Nations troops in the seesaw struggle. General Clark, who is also making an inspection trip, is joined by his field commander, General Van Fleet. And here to make the military picture complete is General Omar Bradley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Major John Eisenhower, now on duty in Korea, is assigned to his father as aide during the president-elect's tour of the war-torn peninsula. It's news from home for Major John. General Ike, who has advocated increasing the South Korean forces, takes particular interest in the new contingents who have proven their mettle. In the welding of an international army, the general is an experienced observer as he moves up and down the ranks of soldiers from 18 nations. And as always, he displays his interest in all soldiers, regardless of rank. It is from face-to-face -face meeting with the troops in the field and assessing the military situation with Allied officers that he must base far-reaching decisions on America's part in the United Nations action. Time out from the fighting is taken for a full dress review by UN units in the general's honor as he takes the salute. Here he sees the hard core of the multinational allies who have for two and a half years withstood the onslaughts of North Koreans and Chinese three times their number. Here he sees for the first time since World War II an international army of free men determined to remain free. But here's time out for Chow, and General Ike sits down with GIs for some pork chops fresh from the field kitchen. And he proves that he hasn't forgotten how to snaffle the sauerkraut that goes with him. Few know better than the general the value of the morale of a fighting force on which high command decisions must be based when he confers with his military and civilian advisors on the future course of the war. Still basing his war plans on an expansion of South Korean forces, he visits a crack division of rocks on a snow-capped ridge where he is greeted by President Syngman Rhee. President Rhee has assured the future President of the United States that his country is eager to assume the major burden of its defense. Modernization of Korean equipment and training courses is one of the main objectives of the General's plans. The rock soldiers have already proven themselves on Sniper Ridge, and now for the benefit of the High Command, they put on an impressive exercise. After the maneuvers, General Eisenhower congratulated President Rhee on the performance of his troops. He thanks the President for the Korean flag, which will eventually be displayed in the White House, memento of an historic mission. <music> Meanwhile, the tidings of Eisenhower's presence draw an estimated half million onto the streets of Seoul. A crowded schedule prevents the president-elect from attending the demonstration, and the vast throng is naturally disappointed. But the mere fact of Ike's visit raises the hopes of this war-ravaged people for the future. At the conclusion of his fateful three-day tour, 8th Army Headquarters is the scene of a much-anticipated press conference. 125 correspondents gather in the war room to hear his summation. As incoming Attorney General Herbert Brownell and other advisors look on, the General tells of his success in gathering first-hand information and ends with a message of hope. As I stated publicly long before we came over here, we came over to learn. We had no panaceas, no trick ways of settling any problems. We came over here to get a grasp of the feeling in this part of the world. They look at the situation and a better understanding of many factors that will be 
important to my associates and myself and to everybody here uh, during the months to come. Much can be done, in my opinion, to improve our position. Much will be done. I think that uh, I'm going to end uh, this little talk with, with paying, again, a different kind of a tribute to the Korean nation. It is in terms of confidence in what I believe they can do uh, with intelligent help given not only uh, for their preservation, but in realization again, as I say, of that principle that freedom is an indivisible thing. I am far from a defeatist on this business because I passionately believe that freedom is a course of, is, represents a course of life that men prefer uh, to communism and slavery. Therefore, I believe that on this a particular corner, this particular phase of this great struggle between these two ideologies, freedom is bound uh, to be successful.